the development of fossil fuels, um, mainly coal, oil, and gas, has been responsible for lifting at least two billion people out of poverty. So let's be clear, fossil fuels have been on balance a good thing in terms of moving GDP and growth around the world. However, the emissions have been building and that externality is now um, triggering real economic impact. Um, we emit about 150 million tons every day, about 40 billion tons every year. And I'm always amazed because I do a lot of public speaking and I go to a lot of events. You cannot turn on the TV or the news today without hearing about all the advances we're making on green and sustainability and climate. But this year, we will emit 40 billion tons. And next year, we'll emit 39 billion tons. There's lots of talk, but the emissions continue. When we talk about investment management, we talk about risk. Risk doesn't lie in the, in the mean of the distribution. Risk is in the tails, the extreme events is where the risk lies. And, and, and I think this is um, very important. If we take the average temperature in the Northern Hemisphere as a baseline from 1951 to 1980, and we have hotter than normal days, normal days, and then colder than normal days. Now we move one decade. We move 10 years from 51 to 80. We move to 1990 to 2000, and we see this shift in the distribution. But while the mean has shifted to here, this is not the concern. The concern lies in the tail of the distribution, the very, very hot days. If we move to 2010 to 2020, now we see that 22% are now the extreme days. We recently had new record temperatures in the United States, in Pakistan, in India. This impacts drought, crop yields, significant reduction in crop yields, and of course, human migration. Everything we do and touch has some kind of carbon footprint. And yet, these are the pathways that we need to be on to achieve 1.5 or 2. That is a dramatic shift. That is dramatic in terms of what we need to do as a society to be on that pathway. And the current pathway we're on is two and a half to three degrees. And I can tell you, having read now more than 200 academic papers and 33 books and been deeply embedded in the science, 2.5 to 3 degrees is a world you do not want your children to grow up in. How can we stimulate, how can we encourage people to reduce emissions? Out of all of these policies, one stands out, and that is when we put a price on emitting. When you put a price on emissions, business and government are very innovative. How do I get around that price? How can I avoid paying a price. We live in a market-based economy. Even China is broadly a market-based economy, and therefore a market-based solution has real impact. And that is what the research shows. This is how it works. Any factory or business that has big emissions above a threshold, that company is notified by the government that they are included in the program. It's mandatory. It means that they are audited every year, and if you emit a million tons of carbon, then in April next year, you must give the government one million carbon permits. The permits are allocated and sold at auctions. So the government sells the permits at auctions. But here's where the first objective comes in. The total supply of permits is capped, and every year, the supply comes down. So we achieve our first objective that emissions within, if you guys are one country, when I lower the supply of permits, someone in the ecosystem must lower their emissions. The question is who? 
who will lower their emissions. And this is the beauty of an emission trading system. If we think about the global economy, here we have the price of carbon per ton. The price of carbon dioxide, $50 a ton. Now in Europe, we're about $100 a ton. And every bar is a different industry. So steel company, a cement company, a refinery. And each company calculates the cost. At what cost can we decarbonize? For some com companies, very, very expensive to decarbonize. But for some companies, they do the calculations. It's very cheap, $10, $20. So when the price is $50, if I can convert my factory and my cost is $10 a ton, what do I do? I convert. I cut my emissions. Do I do that because I'm green? No. Do I do it because I have moral and ethical? No. I cut my emissions and I make the choice because I make more money. It is a profit-driven, market-based incentive. That is the power of the mechanism. I mean, we, globally, we're trading three to five billion dollars every day in carbon. So this is really growing. Um, and that market allows investors and steel companies, cement companies, to hedge a multi-year decarbonization trajectory. Again, very, very important. The revenues, when the government sells the permits, that revenue, now that's, that's hundreds of billions that comes into the government, that is segregated, and the government reinvests the revenue in energy efficiency and low carbon initiatives. So when you step back from this policy as a policy tool, you realize it has multiple benefits to addressing climate change. One of the biggest, though, is the proof in the pudding. In Europe, since the carbon market was launched, emissions in Europe are down 1 billion tons per year. Global emissions, how big are global emissions? 40 gigatons. Reducing by a billion, that's moving the needle. That success in Europe is now why China has chosen to launch a carbon market. Many countries have made COP26 pledges to hit net zero, but they don't have an idea really, how will we reach net zero? They can look at Europe, they can look at California, and now they can look at China as examples of here is a mechanism that you can launch to hit net zero efficiently. At our current run rate of emissions, 40 billion tons per year, we have warmed the planet by 1.2 degrees. We have eight years of run rate. Then we breach 1.5. I'm sorry to say, I know many, many climate change people are, oh, 1.5 degrees. Forget 1.5. We are blowing through 1.5. What's the problem? when we go through these thresholds, what's, what's the problem? The science is very clear. Positive feedback mechanisms on the planet mean our forests, our oceans, and our soils, instead of sequestering carbon, they begin to emit carbon. We hit tipping points where the planet moves into potentially a runaway climate change scenario. We, we must not do that. And therefore, the time remaining and the scale of doing this is very, very important. Um, we looked at four main carbon markets, and when we looked at the performance of carbon, really interesting, as climate change is coming onto the radar screen, carbon prices are rising. That's good, right? We all here, if you want to address climate change, what do we want to see? More carbon pricing coverage, and a higher price. That's what we want. So buying and holding carbon, we are aligned with the policymakers. It's a good thing to own some carbon. Carbon's been going up about 25% per year over the last nine years. Quite interesting. Outperforming all other assets. The really interesting part is it's not correlated. So when you work in my industry, in the asset management industry, we're all seeking to put investments in our portfolio that really have two characteristics. One, a positive expected rate of return. And the second thing, we want to find different investments that are uncorrelated with each other. And carbon, you can see here, 
is really uncorrelated to, to the MSCI world, the Global Equity Index. And that's a very powerful statistic in terms of um, investors seeking something that's diversified. And I'll just close with a, a quote from Sir David Attenborough and a, a picture of a place I love very much was the Saint-Tropez in the south of France. And quite an apocalyptic picture, but um, as uh, Sir David says, we're facing a disaster of global scale. Uh, if we don't take action, the collapse of our civilization and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. And I think that's, uh, that's very true, but there are elements, there's a silver lining, there's hope. But we must really be focused on this uh, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.